Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. Apologize for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. We're just about to get started here. We have today as our guest, B. Mohan Kumar, who will be talking about the national agroforestry policy in India and its progress since its inception uh, in 2014 and some of the challenges is, and opportunities that uh, adopting this policy uh, presents. Our speaker, uh, B. Mohan Kumar, is a leading researcher in agroforestry. He holds a PhD in agronomy from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in New Delhi. Dr. Kumar joined the School of Ecology and Environmental Studies at Nalanda University as a professor in 2015 and was named the dean, acting dean of the school. Before joining Nalanda University, he worked for three years in the Natural Resource Management Division of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. As the Assistant Director General for Agronomy or Agroforestry and Climate Change. Prior to that, he worked for more than 30 years at the Kerala Agricultural University, where he occupied various positions, such as the Associate Dean and Head of the College of Forestry, Professor and Head of the Department of Civil Culture and Agroforestry, and other posts. Professor Kumar's research interests primarily relate to the functional dynamics of tropical agroforestry systems. So Dr. Kumar's presentation will run for about 40, 45 minutes, after which we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes of question and answers, and we'll open up a Q&A box. So uh, please welcome uh, uh, our speaker, B. Mohan Kumar. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Gregory, for that introduction. And good morning to all of you from my side. It is a privilege for me to make this presentation before a very distinguished audience. I thank Shibu, Grigori, and all others who facilitated this. Okay. The government of India announced the national agroforestry policy in the year 2014. It is probably too early to make an impact assessment of this policy. In the next 40 or 45 minutes presentation, what I will be trying to do is to give an overview of the agroforestry systems in India, agroforestry practices in India, particularly focusing on certain historical aspects as well as diversity of agroforestry systems in India. Then I'll be briefly describing the salient attributes of the national agroforestry policy. It's how is it being implemented? What are the challenges and opportunities associated with this particular policy? And then of course I will conclude with a summary. India is regarded as the cradle of agroforestry and various kinds of agroforestry systems were practiced in India since time immemorial. This is probably evident from the rock edicts of Emperor Ashoka. Emperor Ashoka ruled India during the period between 269 to 232 before the current era and second of the 14 rock edicts clearly mentioned that the emperor has advocated his subjects to practice various kinds of agroforestry particularly planting of medicinal herbs and trees planting shade trees along the roadsides and also planting fruit plants on the waste lands which some of these practices can be reckoned as agroforestry even in the present day context. India also has got a great diversity of agroforestry systems. Uh, this slide actually illustrates some of those diverse kinds of agroforestry practices in vogue in India on the 
bottom left hand side you can see the tropical uh, picture of the tropical home garden this tropical home gardens are nothing but intimate multi story associations of trees and crops around the homesteads sometimes in association with animals then you also have a uh, pictures you know, on this particular slide showing other agroforestry systems like uh, the popular based agroforestry which is practiced uh, in the intergenetic plains of india approximately in an area of about 5 million hectares then you have various kinds of agroforestry systems such as tea and coffee in association with shade trees planting of cardamom in the understory of ex natural forests coconut coconut based agroforestry systems these are some of the examples of the diverse kinds of agroforestry systems practiced in india there is also a great degree of <coughs> awareness about the need for tree planting and agroforestry in the indian context this is this slide actually is a uh, show set picture that was drawn by a ninth grade student in a competition that was held in connection with the world agroforestry congress that was held in new delhi new delhi during the year 2014 and this slide as you can see shows that uh, mother earth holding a tree on the left hand and then various kinds of ecosystem services that are associated with tree planting and agroforestry are also portrayed in this one and uh, this slide this picture uh, won the first prize in that competition and you know you can see on the bottom in the inset uh, the girl called niharika from coimbatore who won the first prize in this competition receives the award and trophy from the president of india sri pranab mukherjee agroforestry plays a vital role in the indian economy you know trees grown on farms actually provide 65% of the total timber requirement of the country and it also provides various other tangible and intangible benefits particularly like you know the subsistence needs of the society such as food fuel fodder timber so on and so forth medicinal plants all these are derived from agroforestry system and it is often regarded as the only alternative to meet the target of increasing the forest cover to 33% which is currently as you can see here current the forest cover in india is around 23% and agroforestry is regarded as the only process or mechanism by which uh, the forest cover cover of india of the country can be increased from 23 to the to the targeted level of 33% and it is often estimated it has been estimated some estimates show that there are about 43 million hectares of land area which are potentially suitable for agroforestry however the actual extent of agroforestry area in the country is much less according to some estimates this may range between 11 million hectares to as high as 25.6 million hectares and uh, the re there are several constraints that inhibit that prevent the adoption of agroforestry uh, by the farmers at large this slide shows what lacks what causes the lack of adop adoption of agroforestry probably the first and foremost reason that inhibits the adoption of agroforestry practices is the restrictive forestry regulatory regimes that requires uh, permit from the state forest department for cutting and transporting timber grown on the farms then there may be also weak agroforestry ex extension systems uh, which may be again inhibiting the I mean the 
state agriculture department and the state forest departments in india in india are generally not considered to be the best agencies for providing agroforestry extension there is hardly any agency that can give agroforestry extension as of now so this is a another weakness it another major factor that causes lack of adoption of agroforestry then of course dearth of quality planting material uh, is yet another reason why agroforestry is not picking up um, in the in the country then there may be also lack of credit and insurance support and weak market access all these cumulatively result in the non adoption of agroforestry by the cultivators so it was again against this background that the agroforestry policy was formulated by the government of india uh, as you probably might know agriculture and forestry were treated as separate watertight compartments over a historical period of time and agroforestry agroforestry actually tries to integrate agriculture and forest as you can see from the crumbling walls the national agroforestry policy which was launched in the year 2014 does not actually create a separate policy window for agroforestry but rather aims to harmonize policies on either sides namely agriculture and forestry and it is expected to facilitate credit and insurance to farmers besides improving market access to the farmers regarding the genesis of this policy i mean this was the outcome of a series of efforts by the national advisory council together with international collaborators such as the acraf and various national stakeholders such as the department of agriculture and cooperation government of india the indian council of agriculture government of india and the ministry of environment and environment forest and climate change government of india all these agencies representatives from all these agencies were uh, together formulated this policy uh, draft which was approved by the government of india and it was announced during the uh, third World Congress on Agroforestry, which was held in New Delhi during 2014. Although India is the first country to have a full-fledged agroforestry policy, there are several other countries, at least about 15 other countries, which has got some kind of a policy prescription on agroforestry. The next slide actually lists all those countries. Brazil, Costa Rica, Cameroon, China, Dominican Republic, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Kenya, Malawi, Niger, Nepal, Philippines, Tanzania, USA and Zambia are those countries which are having some kind of a policy prescription although a full fledged agroforestry like that of India is probably not uh, present not available with many of these countries for instance probably Brazil has but as a policy which is pretty much similar to that of india brazil has a national policy on crop livestock forest integration china has got what is called the grain for green policy wherein the farmers in the upland watershed areas are compensated by providing food grains for any afforestation activity that they might be taking up european union has got what is called a common agricultural policy where the farmers are compensated are provided uh, incentives for retaining trees on the farmlands tanzania also has got a national agroforestry policy the usa of course as you know he is having an agroforestry strategic framework for the fiscal year 2011 to 2016 where you know you have a uh, trying to where the government of the federal government of the united states of america is promoting agroforestry as a land use option it's also intensifying research nepal has got what is called the kathmandu declaration where it has been proclaimed that soon the government of nepal will evolve an agroforestry policy 
speaking about the indian or the national agroforestry policy of india it has got uh, five major roles five major goals as you can see here the first and foremost is bringing convergence coordination and synergy among various elements of agroforestry scattered in various agencies pertaining to agriculture environment forestry rural development and rural development sectors of the government of india so convergence of these multifarious activities that are coming under the umbrella of agroforestry has to be coordinated that is one of the principal object principal goals of the policy then it also aims to improve the productivity employment income and livelihood livelihood opportunities of rural household especially the small holder farmers through agroforestry then meet the ever increasing demand for full fuel fodder timber fertilizer and other agroforestry product products which is actually uh, for which there is a need to increase the availability of these from outside the natural forest so that is at another major uh, goal of the policy then conserve natural resources and forests protect the environment and providing environmental security increase the forest or tree cover and for which you know agroforestry is often regarded as a convenient solution to an inconvenient problem like deforestation or shrinking forest resource base agroforestry as i have mentioned earlier is considered to be one of the approaches one of the mechanism by which uh, the 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 targeted area of 33% forest cover can be achieved uh and in the in the in india there are ten strategies that has been proposed under this policy first and foremost or the most important one is establishment establishment of an institutional setup at the national level to promote agroforestry uh, then simplify the various regulatory mechanisms such like such as the forest laws and policies which actually restrict or prohibit uh, cutting of farm grown timber unless there is a permit from the state forest agencies simplifying those mechanisms then uh, develop a sound database and information system particularly relating to land tenure and issues related to tree inventory which is actually a gray area in the present context then intensify research extension capacity building and related activities provide institutional credit and insurance cover for agroforestry at, at this moment there is hardly any institutional credit facilities or insurance cover for agroforestry systems so this is one of the this has been proposed as one of the strategies for increasing the adoption of agroforestry in the country facilitating increased participation of industries dealing with agroforestry particularly in the context of uh, nursery production qualities planting material production certification of nursery and also processing and value addition of agroforestry produce strengthening market access uh, for tree products and to incentivize farmers for adopting agroforestry and what has been proposed in the in the policy is to provide a tax holidays until the trees become available for harvest or maybe uh, uh, interest free loans for establishing agroforestry plantations and systems and then finally promoting sustainable agro agroforestry for renewable biomass energy biomass based energy like planting of tree based oil seeds and other crops or maybe biomass crops to meet the energy requirement of the farmers like particularly like uh, running farm machinery uh, uh, use the biomass fuel or bio by tree oils oils on the tree based oil seed crops this has been a, one of the strategies that has been proposed under this particular policy of agroforestry regarding implementation speaking about implementation uh, two years as you probably know is 
a relatively short period of time for evaluating the impact of any policy, not to speak of a, a policy involving long duration crops like tree crops. However, there have been there has been indications that the government of India is walking the talk. Uh, there are at least uh, there are indications that uh, major in initiatives are made by the government to implement the agroforestry. Financial approval, financial approval has been accorded for creating what, what is called a national mission on agroforestry. This will be one of the component missions under the national mission on sustainable agriculture. So financial approval has been given during, uh, before the close of the last financial year for, us, for setting up a national mission on agroforestry. Several states of the, uni of the Union of India have also taken steps to streamline the regulatory framework for felling and transport of timber on private lands, on farm lands. Earlier I have indicated that, uh, you know, this has been one of those constraints that prevent the adoption of agroforestry in India. Uh, many of those uh, rules and regulations that require the farmers to obtain cutting permit and transit passes for felling, for harvesting the timber grown on their farmlands. And many of many states have now proposed or are in the process of be, being process of simplifying those procedural requirements, those regulatory regimes, so that uh, the agroforestry systems or trees grown by the far, on the farmlands can be harvested without much hassle. Also, the corporate social responsibility guidelines have been amended to put agroforestry as one of the activities under the ambit of corporate social responsibility. The Prime Minister of India has been advocating a slew of agroforestry measures over a period over the past two years or so. You know, he has advocated, he has suggested that in one of, a couple of his speeches actually, he has suggested that uh, uh, he has advocated tree planting on every farm boundary <laughs> or field risers. In Hindi, this is called the Har Made Pay Pay. So this is nothing but planting of trees on every farm boundary to augment the tree resources to, uh, to provide for environmental services. This has been one of the one of the uh, one of the key points that the Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, has been making repeatedly in his speeches. He has been also recommending advocating planting of trees to celebrate the birth of a girl child. You know, in India, this is a sensitive issue, and uh, he has advocated that, uh, advocated to plant five trees to celebrate a daughter's birth, so that they will fetch you enough funds for meeting the expenses relating to her wedding. This has been one of the recommendations that the Prime Minister has been making again and again, repeatedly in his speeches. Then he also suggested that, uh, to earmark one third of the farm land for planting trees to augment farmer income. Actually, there has been a plan uh, on the part of the government of India to double farm income by the year 2022. 20, uh, and the planting of trees has been suggested as one of those mechanisms by which this target can be, this goal can be achieved. And to strengthen research the National Agroforestry, National Research Center for Agroforestry has been elevated as a central agroforestry research institute. The NRC Agroforestry at Jhansi has been elevated uh, in the year 2015. Um, 
to the level of a full fledged national institute. That is primary. One of the recommendations of the policy has been, or one of the strategies has been to augment research, extension, and capacity building in agroforestry to meet that objective. The government of India has decided to elevate the status of this NRC agroforestry into a full fledged national institute called the CFR, Central Agroforestry Research Institute. Okay, now although significant headway was made with respect to the implementation of agroforestry policy in India, there are still many cha challenges for developing agroforestry in India. I mean, one of the principal bottlenecks in that context is the non available, non existence of a proper institutions set up at the grassroots level dedicated for extension service network for agroforestry at the state, district and sub-district level. And now the, what has been decided is to set up a national agroforestry mission at the national level, but um, at the state, district and sub-district level, as of now, there is nothing to promote agroforestry or to provide agroforestry extension services to the farmers. So that is one of the major challenges that will be one of the major challenges in the coming years. There has been also farmers are also concerned about reduced the crop yield primarily because of the competition for site resources, above ground site resources, below ground site resources, and because of that, there has been concern among the farmers that uh, agricultural crop productivity or food crop yield levels will be lower if it is uh, grown in association with the Tree, plants, tree crops. So there has to be extension mechanisms by which uh, this concern can be overcome. By choosing appropriate tree and crop species so that the yield of the food crops are not adversely affected. Shrinking holding size is one another, yet another important constraint in the context of agroforestry in India. The holding size in India is much lower than many other states and the average holding size in India is 1.16 hectares and you know with such small holding size and also for the fragmentation of these holding size primarily because of the huge population pressure uh, planting large scale I and mean, undertaking large scale tree planting could be a challenge. Okay, so appropriate tree idiotypes which can be grown on small holdings in association with agricultural crops, food crops need to be undertaken by the research and extension systems. Land tenure and tree tenure, okay, this is yet another challenge. You know, in many areas there are no clear titles or clear, I mean, unclear status of the land and tree resources. This is a another challenge, especially for farmers who are, you know, uh, leasing lands for cultivation. They have no incentive to practice uh, or to undertake tree planting. So this tree tenure or land tenure issues are also inhibiting. This could be a major challenge in the context of adoption of agroforestry. Okay, the common property resources or sustainable utilization of the common property resources such as grazing land, common lands, water bodies, particularly with respect to the delineation of rights and responsibilities and sharing of the use of rights are major challenges. So there are common grazing lands or other kinds of common property resources. Utilization of that for agroforestry <coughs> as of now is a challenge uh, or such sustainable utilization of that is yet another challenge. Value addition and market linkages are weak spots as far as adoption of agroforest or this is, this is one of those negative factors I, I have mentioned earlier too, that that uh, inhibit the adoption of large scale adoption of agroforestry. There are, however, 
many opportunities. Most of these opportunities, as you will understand, flow directly from the policy goals. You know, there is the policy aims at increasing income and employment, greater adoption of agroforestry is generally recognized as a mechanism by which income and employment of the farmers can be enhanced. And then reducing import dependence. India is one country which imports large quantities of timber from outside. I mean, last year, I think we imported, India imported timber worth six to seven billion US dollars. And round timber alone has been, I mean, India is one of the uh, f top five countries that import round timber. I think 14, 15, uh, India imported round timber to the tune of about 6.5 million cubic meters from other countries. Increasing forest cover as you can see here it's a total opportunity as I have mentioned earlier you know the present forest cover of the of India is 23 percent and the national target is to augment it to 33 percent and agroforestry is often recognized as one of those principal mechanisms by which this can be achieved. And uh, uh, agroforestation will certainly enhance um, the tree cover or the, the forest cover in the country. And then climate change mitigation and adaptation through convergence and linkages with the, the National Action Plan for Climate Change, NAPCC, is another major opportunity. Under the NAPCC, there are three missions like NMSA, National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture, NMC, National Mission on Sustaining Himalayan Ecosystems, and uh, National Mission on Green India. These are three missions which are directly linked to agroforestry practices. And by converging, I mean, uh, under the National NM Gym, the, that is the National Mission for a Green India. It has been targeted that uh, over the 10 years from 2011, about 3 million hectares will be brought into agroforestry. So convergence and coordination and linkages with this mission will be yet another opportunity for implementing the national agroforestry policy. And uh, will bring about climate change <coughs> mitigation and adaptation. Opportunities also include convergence and linkage with the, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. This incidentally is one of those flagship programs of the Ministry of Rural Development Government of India to improve the livelihood security, income and employment of the rural people. So this Mandrega program also can be linked up with it. But it has been proposed in the policy to have convergence with Mandrega and that will certainly enhance the adoption of agroforestry. Likewise, like Mandrega, the Integrated Watershed Management Project, IWMP, there is also potential and scope for convergence with IWMP and agroforestry, primarily for biodiversity conservation, drought proofing, and for livelihood security. These are some of the opportunities for implementing the National Agroforestry Policy of the Government of India 2014. The principal focus of the National Agroforestry Policy has been by and large to promote the industrial models of agroforestry. Okay, and it tends to ignore the traditional agroforestry systems like the tropical home gardens, low pasture trials, etc., which has been called uh, the central agroforestry system by P.K. Nair and his colleagues. So there, there is certainly a need for revitalizing this traditional agroforestry system, which is probably not a clear focal theme of the national agroforestry policy, which by and large concentrates and focuses on the industrial models of agroforestry. Also, there, although there has been incentive schemes such as uh, 
rebate, tax rebates, interest rebates, etc., especially during the gestation period of the tree crops, there has been no provision or no schemes for payment for ecosystem services. That's another missing link as far as the national agroforestry policy is concerned. To summarize, the National Agroforestry Policy 2014 of India is the first ever full-fledged national, national agroforestry policy. And it has multiple objectives such as encouraging plantation of trees in complementarity and integrated with crops, livestock, to increase productivity, employment, income, particularly for the smallholder farmers. Another objective of this is to supplement the requirements of yellow fodder, timber, minor forest produce for the rural and tribal populations, thereby reducing the pressure on the natural forest. To ease the pressure on agroforestry is often recognized as one of those mechanisms by which you can reduce the pressure on natural forest. And then complement the target of increasing forest cover or green cover to 33% from the present level of 23%. And the government of India has, as I have explained, made bold initiatives to mainstream agroforestry by promoting integrated farming systems. However, there are challenges such as fragmented holdings, lack of proper institutional setup, especially at the grassroots level, generally speaking, constrain the adoption of agroforestry. Opportunities include enhanced return, climate change mitigation and adaptation, enhanced tree cover, so on and so forth. Okay, with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for the patient listening. Over to you. Well, thank you, Mohan. Thank uh, you, Mohan. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for being here. Uh, I, I should mention uh, that uh, we'll have a uh, time for some question and answer, and that we also have a, a unique arrangement today. We have both an in-house audience as well as the online audience. Uh, for the folks online, I'm about to open a question and answer uh, box here, and you can find a dialogue box down below. And please uh, go ahead and type in any questions you might have. For our audience here in, in the room, if you have a question, please come forward and uh, close the mic so we can be picking up and, and, and uh, please, anyone with questions, come forward. Uh, maybe to get things started, I'll, I'll, I'll put a question uh, to you uh, or to, to you, Mohan. Um, I'm curious to know more about just, just how, uh, under the previous uh, regulatory arrangements that were very strict in terms of permitting, uh, that any tree and timber felling had to be strictly permitted, and how that I'm, I'm guessing was a real yes. disincentive to tree planting uh, in private or farmlands. Um, should you maybe hear more about how that worked as a disincentive to tree planting, and then also looking forward, if there's going to be um, a relaxation of uh, restrictions on being able to cut timber on farmlands, whether there's any risk of uh, that it'll perhaps incentivize uh, tree planting on on, on farmland, but is there any risk of, uh, of it causing also uh, accelerated cutting of any forested areas that are currently on, on farmlands? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Good question. Uh, my response to what you asked is that yes. previously, if there, were, if there were trees on the farmland, the farmer has to obtain two sets of permits from the state forest agencies. One the cutting trim, cutting permit. Of course, this cutting permit is required for some of the high value timber species only. Like this, there is of course variation from state to state. In the state of Kerala, there are 10 tree species that are coming under this uh, permit regime. So if you have a tree of any of these 10 species listed in the regulation, then you need to apply to the state forest department for getting a cut, cutting permit. And then of course, you also need a, a transit pass in order for in order to transport this timber outside India market or into a mill to uh, for uh, or into a mill. 
So these are the two types of permits that were required earlier. But now what has been proposed is that uh, at least for about 20 predominant species, that, 20 species that are predominantly grown in agroforestry, these kinds of permit regimes should be dismantled. There may not be any requirement for obtaining permits for the predominantly predominant agroforestry species. And as you said, uh, Gregory, this of course, this is a flip side that there may be sometimes over harvesting and that may uh, deplete uh, the tree cover on the private landscape. This is a danger that is associated with that. Of course, then, you know, when there is uh, better prices, farmers may tend to overcut and uh, if that, that is of course one of those uh, pitfalls associated with dismantling of these regulatory uh, regimes. Oh, oh yes, thank you, Mohan. Oh, yes. um, um, well, I would encourage our, our, our live audience to come forward uh, and, and uh, present any questions. And I would also encourage our online audience to also uh, 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 type any of your questions into the dialog box you see at the bottom of the Q&A box there. So I think we have, please go ahead, uh, Dr. Shabu Joes, Director of the Center for Agriculture. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, for such a wonderful uh, enlightening talk. Uh, of course, I knew about the policy when I was there in 2014 when it was announced, but we didn't know much about the details. But it was uh, really good to hear about some of the details of the 2014 policy. Well, you talked about the industrial model of agroforestry in India. And I don't know if uh, some of us are really familiar with you know, that particular model. So would you please elaborate on the industrial model of agroforestry that is being practiced in India? Okay, thank you, Shibu. The major industrial models of agroforestry that are practiced in India, of course, the poplar based agroforestry, which I hear in between that there may be in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, this is the predominant agroforestry system, poplar plus wheat or poplar plus uh, mustard. These are the two crops that are grown in association with the post poplar crop, poplar tree. And uh, this is approximately grown in an area, or present area estimate is something like 5 million hectares in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Then the other prominent uh, industrial models of agroforestry includes the, the eucalyptus-based production systems. This is happening in the uh, southern India, the western India, where in the eucalyptus is also one of those industrial species which the farmers have been growing. And then you also have species like industrial species like cashew rhino, maybe some of the other uh, lesser grown species also grown by as industrial like Anthocephalus, Kadamba, and uh, uh, Elandus, uh, Excelsa, Elandus, Trifysa. These species are grown, I mean, some of these industries actually require raw material. I mean, many of the industries, wood-based industries in India are facing raw material, acute raw material shortages. And uh, there have been uh, programs by industry to promote these the, the promote growing of trees on private farmlands so that the the industrial units can meet their raw material requirement and uh, this is happening in the in the northwestern plains zone the Indo-Gangetic plains you know, where eucalyptus uh, poplar more importantly are grown by the farmers and then it actually feeding into the the, the mills the industries are meet, getting their raw material again. And, in, and since there is still a, a deficit as far as meeting the industrial uh, raw material requirement, we are, we are importing timber from other countries also, or maybe wood and wood products from other countries. Did I answer you? Okay, thank you, uh, okay, thank you. For, for that question. Uh, we do have one question from uh, an online participant. Uh, Eli Roberts uh, writes in and asks, is deforestation pressure primarily from smallholders harvesting logs and, and fuel wood or from timber companies harvesting logs for export or, or perhaps for other, for the, for the, for the timber industry? Um, 
he asks, are any agroforestry systems focused on export markets? Okay. Okay. The deforestation problem in India is neither from private industries cutting timber because India under the Forest Conservation Act of 1980, green felling is not permitted. So industries or private farmers cannot go and cut trees in the natural forest. What we are talking about here is the trees on agricultural landscape, the private lands. Farmers, there are, because of the, what I was trying to say earlier, because of the restrictions uh, in terms of forest laws and forest regulations, that the, most of those uh, regulations have acted as disincentives for growing of timber. So if those disincentives are removed, then that may accelerate the pace of agroforestry development. India, the forest resource base of India has, although it is around 23%, it has stabilized over the past few years. Now I'm talking about the natural forest. The natural forest base of India has stabilized. There is no serious deforestation except in some pockets like the Northeastern India where you have Northeast and rural region of India, where you have shifting cultivation, and uh, which is a problem. But otherwise, by and large, the forest resource base of the country has stabilized, and currently it is around 23%. So, what, what I have been trying to say, point out, was with respect to the trees on the agricultural landscape, and uh, there may be a potential danger, as I answered in response to the question by Gregory that uh, if all these regulations are suddenly uh, uh, dismantled, there may be a danger of sometimes overcutting. To what extent, uh, at this moment, I am not in a position to predict. Okay, uh, thank you. So I, I you. guess the understanding is that, uh, yes, that you mentioned uh, the current uh, level of forest cover is relatively stable. There's not deforestation pressure, I guess. That most of the deforestation most has already occurred over uh, historically. Yeah, and India, India, if I may interject, India is a low deforestation, low forest country. As per the FAO forest resource based classification. Right. Uh, please, uh, we still have a few more minutes, so if there are any other questions from, from uh, our in-house audience or from uh, the online viewers, uh, do please uh, uh, put forth your question. Um, if there's any more uh, writing questions, please, uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Mike Gold, Associate Director of the Center for Agroforestry. Yes, um, uh, I, I just have quite, I mean, uh, you're talking about a, a massive national undertaking, right? And a lot of this, at, at this point, you've talked about government, national government. So the question, two questions. One is, at the local level, is there uh, a high level of trust between local population and extension? And two, is there uh, a good organization of NGOs that would be another potential partner to help facilitate the national government policy? Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Your, your first point was that, is there any trust between the local community and the, the extension mechanism? As I mentioned during my presentation, agroforestry extension is one of the weakest links in this chain as of now. This needs to be strengthened. And uh, you know the forestry department and the state agriculture departments, they do not undertake any extension activity as far as agroforestry is concerned. So this is one of the major weaknesses as far as the whole uh, system is concerned, the whole country is concerned. Then you are other point was with respect to NGO. NGOs. Yes, the answer is yes, Sanchino. There are some NGOs. And also there are many private com companies which are doing a, which are playing a big role as far as agroforestry, practicing agroforestry is concerned. And uh, like ITC, like earlier there used to be, ITC is one of those cigarette companies, tobacco companies, Indian tobacco uh, companies. And similarly, there are Many of those big private corporations into 
agroforestry. But then there are also certain NGOs in the central India, which again is participating in it or promote, trying to promote agroforestry. Many of them are actually into what is called organic agriculture. And agroforestry uh, may have an interface with uh, organic agriculture. So there are there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm with respect to organic agriculture and agroforestry may be one of those the routes to attain organic agriculture. Thank you, Nick. Okay, it looks like we have uh, one more. Like we have one. one more question. One more question. One more question from our live audience. Please, Sugata, go ahead, please. So, um, just following up on Dr. Gold's uh, question, uh, recently in the past, uh, the NGOs, foreign, mainly foreign-funded NGOs, has been a uh, controversial is issue, and there has been over 9,000 NGOs that were uh, cancelled by the government of India. How do you uh, think uh, that will impact uh, foreign collaboration on issues of agroforestry and foreign uh, collaborations uh, in general uh, on agroforestry? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would not think that this, that uh, that act by the government of India is not going to uh, influence this program very much because most of them are not actually most of those huge number of NGOs are not involved in the practice of in, in agroforestry related activities. So I would not think that that may be having a that may be having a major impact. But then NGOs, private sector organizations and NGOs should get more involved in this process. At this moment, of course, private sector organizations are into agroforestry. So I mean, not a whole lot of them, but there are significant uh, companies, number of companies involved in agroforestry, but not so many NGOs as I can see it. Only very few of them are involved in agroforestry. Mm -hmm. What foundation Yeah, <laughs> that's a government policy. <laughs> uh, Greenpeace yeah, had a lot of yeah. lot of issues. So with, okay. I mean, that's where like organizations. It may have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but. As far as agroforestry is concerned, I would not think that this is going to have a major negative impact because most of them are not in the this area of agroforestry. That's why, if there were if some of these NGOs who are involved in agroforestry are banned, then as certainly as their activities would be adversely affected. But as of now, as far as I can know, uh, I can say, not a large number of such NGOs are. Involved. Well, thank you, uh, well, thank to, uh, you Dr. Uh, Kumar, and thank you for everyone here in thank the... Thank you all. Thank you all for the patient listening. Uh, so if there's no further questions... Uh, oh, we do have a, one additional uh, question just came in. Very good. From, uh, from Ajay Sharma from Lincoln University. Uh, he asked, do you think India will achieve its goal of 33% forest and tree cover? This is our hope and belief. We trust that by promoting agroforestry, if not 33%, we can significantly enhance the tree and forest cover of the country. That's our expectation. So the hope and expectation. Well, uh, time will tell. And again, only two years into the adoption, it's very early to uh, really have any uh, real measurements of, 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 uh, of impact. Uh, True. So, uh, if there's no further so, questions, uh, there's no oh, good, we have another one. Just comes in right? just as I'm about to, <laughs> to close out. Well, very good. Kudlu Sudhakara, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, asks, when is the national agroforestry policy to be implemented in India? Thank you. Well, Thank you, Sudhakara. This is already on. I think the during March, we have, uh, the government of India have approved the financial sanction for establishing the national mission on agroforestry which is actually a component mission of the bigger activity called nmsa national mission on sustainable agriculture so, so the process is already on thank you very good uh well we've uh, come to the hour uh, uh, so i think it's uh without any uh, no further questions i think we can uh, well conclude uh,
webinar. So we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Kumar. Thank you very much for, for being with us and, and uh, making this presentation. Thank you so much for our, our uh, audience today in, in, the, in the room for participating. And to those of you listening online, thank you as well for your participation. Uh, this has been a, another presentation in the Agroforestry in Action webinar series produced by the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. Uh, please uh, visit our, our website, agroforestryinaction.org, for information on upcoming uh, webinars, schedules, and information on, on future webinars. Please join us next month uh, for in July. Uh, we will have Dr. Sarah Taylor Lovell from uh, presenting. And um, once again, thank you much for everyone for being here. See you next time. Bye bye. Well, I have a question. <laughs>